Hi guys, stats for the AKT. Wow, I used to hate preparing for stats when I did my AKT exam myself, because I know it's something that people often struggle with. This video is all about giving you a little bit of confidence when it comes to dealing with stats for your preparation and also in the exam itself. I think there's three things that I see quite commonly when it comes to stats. Number one, people fear it. Yeah, it's something that people don't understand. When we don't understand something, you get frightened of it, and that tends to make people leave it behind. Number two, people ignore it. They think, well, it's only a small percentage of marks. If I just leave it out, actually, if I do really well in the other two areas, I should be fine. You want to avoid that as well. And number three, cram it. People cram stats right at the end. In last weekend, for example, they learn a whole load of equations. Actually, does it help? Probably not, because when you're faced with a question where you have to work things out, those equations, the knowledge of the equations without knowing the principles, don't really help. I'm Amin Aurora, I'm a GP and educator, and hopefully this video is going to give you a little bit of confidence when you prepare for your stats, not only for the preparation period, but also when you hit that day when you're stressed and nervous itself. Let's get started. So we're going to start off simple, or what most people think is simple. When you get a list of numbers or results, people often get confused between median, mode, mean, and range. So let's clarify some of those really quickly. So we get a set of numbers or results. One, one, two, three, three, six, 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 and eight. Now, if they're asking you to find the mean of these numbers, it's very simple, isn't it? You add all the numbers up, so 36. And you divide it by the number that we've got, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So your average, or your mean, is 4. Now if you're asking for the median, that simply just means the middle value. So if you've got 9 values in total, the middle one is going to be number 3. 4 on this side, 4 on that side, so your median is simply the middle value out of your set. What's the mode? The mode is simply the number or value that happens most often. So in this case, six, you've got one, two, three values of six, therefore your mode, or the most frequent value in place there is the number six. And if you're looking at range, your range is simply your maximum value minus your minimum value. So in this case, it'd be eight minus one, so your range is seven. Now that's a very simple set of numbers, but you could get a, a list of numbers of 50 or 60 plus, and then it can go a bit challenging. But from the exam point of view, you need to understand these four basic principles. The mean or average, the median or middle value, the mode or the one that's most often, and the range, the maximum minus the minimum. Now the other thing that's quite useful to understand early on when it comes to statistics is looking at the spread of results and the shape of the distribution. So you'll all have probably seen this sort of shape before. So that's your kind of Bell's curve, isn't it? Or your normal distribution. Things are equally um, spaced on either side. But you can also get some other results as well that are not in a normal distribution or skewed. So something like this, for example. So that's obviously uh, not a normal distribution, not a Bell's curve. And the reason for understanding this early is that it has implications on what statistical tests you can use with those values or results later on. And we'll come on to those in a short period of time. But in essence, just remember, you've got to work out whether the results are normally distributed or not normally distributed. If they're normally distributed, you can use what we call parametric tests for statistical significance. If they're not normally distributed, you have to use non-parametric tests. And like I said, we'll mention these a little bit later on. So let's have a look at some of the studies that you're going to come across. Three key ones that you're going to hear a lot of are cohort, case control, or cross-sectional. What are the main differences? So a cohort study is usually a prospective study, so you're looking forward. So you get two cohorts. You look at people, for example, who drink alcohol, and you get a cohort of people who don't drink alcohol. And the idea is that you follow them forward to see if they develop a particular condition, for example, liver cancer. And when you come across cohort studies, you're going to be looking at things like risk ratios. Because you're going to look at the risk of having something or not having something and an ultimate outcome. 
This is a bit different to a case control trial, or case control study, should I say. In a case control study, you're looking retrospectively. So you're looking at cases versus people who are controlled. So for example, cases of people who have liver cancer versus control. So people who don't have liver cancer, and you're looking backwards to see some of their habits, to see what could potentially have been a cause or related to what they've developed later on. So for example, you look backwards to see whether these people drank alcohol, or whether these people didn't drink alcohol. And that way you can start to look at some of the relationships between causes of certain conditions. And when you come to case control studies, you'll hear a lot about odds ratios. So what are the odds of someone who drank alcohol, for example, developing liver cancer later on in life? And thirdly, you get your cross-sectional studies. So these are really useful for looking at prevalence. So they're all about looking at a population at a specific point of time, and you can work out a few things related to that. But prevalence of conditions is something that you'll see this quite commonly with. But these are all examples of observational studies as opposed to clinical trials, which we'll come on to now. So let's shift focus to clinical trials. Now clinical trials or intervention trials are useful for looking forward to see if a new drug, for example, has any effect on, for example, hypertension. So you get a group of 50 patients, half of them will be given a placebo, half of them will be given this new drug, and you wanna see what the effects are long-term and see if it's gonna be valuable in clinical practice at some point in the future. Now here are different, lots of different types of clinical trials. So firstly, the first bit that you're gonna come across is your randomized versus non-randomized. Now, what does that mean? Randomized just means that there's no pre-selection going on in terms of which patients get what. So for example, out of those 50 patients, it's completely random as to whether they're gonna get a placebo or whether they're going to end up getting the new drug. Whereas in a non-randomized trial, it might not be the case. There may be some pre-selection issues there um, and therefore the robustness of the study is not as strong. But even in a randomized controlled trial, you're gonna get two main types. You've got single-blinded and you've got double-blinded. Now, a single-blinded trial just means that the patients in those trials have no idea whether they, get, they are getting the placebo or whether they're being treated with the new drug. Whereas in a double-blinded trial, both the patients and the trialists have no idea whether the patient is getting the placebo or the new drug, which makes it a much more robust type of randomized controlled trial going forward when you're looking at those results to see whether there's evidence that we actually we could use this in real life at some point. So when you come across clinical trials, make sure you understand is there randomized or non-randomized? And if it's randomized, is it a single blind or is it double blind? Because they make a difference in how you interpret the results. So say you've done a clinical trial and you've got a set of results in front of you. How do you look into these results to look for things like significance? So the first thing you have to do is look at the distribution of results, like we talked about earlier. Does it follow a normal bell-shaped curve or is there a slightly skewed set of results? And that determines what tests you can use to look for things like statistical significance. So if it's a bell-shaped curve, you can use tests like t-test or chi-squared, for example. If you have a non-normal distribution, then you use your non-parametric test, so things like Man whitney u um, to look at whether these are actually significant or not. So it's important to know which type of tests are useful and which type of results distributions. But the whole point of doing these kind of things is to look at things like the p-value, which I'm sure you guys have come across already. So what's a p-value? It's in essence the probability that the results that you've got from your trial well, as to whether they're due to chance or not. So you want your p-value to be as low as possible. Because the lower the, the p-value, the lower the probability that these results are simply due to chance and nothing due to the intervention that you've put in place. So for example, if you have that those set of patients who half had a placebo and half had a new antihypertensive, you want to know if the results that have come from that trial are statistically significant or, in essence, whether they were just due to chance. So that's why you need to look at things like p-value. So the number that you traditionally look for is a value of less than 0.5. Because if your p-value is less than 0.5, then what you're saying is there's less than a 1 in 20 chance that these results are due to chance. It's quite probable that they're actually statistically significant. Obviously, the lower you go, 0.05, 0.001, for example, the less probability these results do chart, and therefore the more statistically significant these results are. So when you get a clinical trial, p-values come up a lot. It's important to look at that p-value and aim for as low as possible. So a couple of other terms that you might come across when you're looking at clinical trials and results. The first is 
your null hypothesis. And all the null hypothesis is, is that you're predicting at the beginning that any results that come your way from this trial are going to be due to chance. So in essence, you're trying to reject the null hypothesis by looking at things like p-values to prove that actually the results are of statistical significance. And the other thing that you might come across quite frequently are the CIs or the confidence intervals. Now, if you think back to when we earlier on in this video, we talked about the mean value of a set of results. Now, instead of the mean, all the confidence interval is, is a range of results where you think that the true value lies within. So if you get a really narrow set of confidence intervals, which you tend to get in some of the larger trials, that's really what you're looking for, because what you're saying is you can be pretty confident that the real value lies in between these two sets. Because if you get a really large set of confidence intervals, which you can get in some of the smaller trials, then actually you, you're not so confident because what you're saying is that the results can lie between this point here and this point here, and we're not really sure, it could be anywhere in between. So when you're looking at clinical trial results, make sure you not only look at the p-value, but also look at the confidence intervals as well, and try and aim for those which are much shorter and narrower as opposed to that are much larger. And before we move away from trials and studies, just a couple of things to mention. The difference between a systematic review and a meta-analysis, you might come across these terms quite a lot. A systematic review is in essence a review of all the trials that look at a particular area of interest. So for example, all the trials covering uh, a particular drug and its effect on hypertension. It's not always statistically um, looked at, but it's just a, a review of everything out there. Whereas a meta-analysis is a quantitative or a statistical review of all of the data that are out there for a particular area. So the slight difference in the two is that one is just a generalized review, it doesn't have to have statistics in it, whereas the meta-analysis gets the numbers out and looks at it in a more quantitative way. So one of the other areas that people often struggle with is screening tests and looking at tables and working out things like sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value. So let's try and cover some of those things using examples because that's I think how we tend to learn things a little bit best. So say for example you have 50 patients and they've all gone through a test to look to see whether they have for example knee arthritis. You want to know how good is that test in working that particular clinical question out. So the first thing to do is think about drawing a table out. And the tables are pretty uh, similar depending, it doesn't matter what test it is or what condition you're looking for, but it's about getting used to drawing those tables and understanding what they mean. So think about your disease or the condition along the top and think about having the test, whether it's positive or negative, along the vertical axis. So, so disease or condition on the top, so disease yes or Disease no along the top, and then test positive, and test negative down here. Just up a little bit. And the first thing I used to do is put letters in these boxes just so I made it easy for myself. So I call it A, B. C and D, and that becomes the same for each and every time. And it's worth just working out what these things represent. So the top left box is going to represent your true positives. So essentially all those tests that come back positive, how many of those are actually true, so the ones that have the disease. Your bottom right is going to be your true negatives. So in essence, of the negative results, how many of those were true? How many don't actually have the condition? The top line is going to be your false positives. So of all of those tests that are positive, that actually they don't have the condition, so false positive. And then down here is going to be your false negatives. So of those who have a negative test, which of those are false, i.e. which ones did they miss the condition in? So if you can get this kind of pattern working each and every time, you can understand things a little bit better. So the next thing to do when you've got your table is to try and populate it with some numbers. So 
you're gonna get a little case vignette. So you're gonna get something that says things like, out of the 50 people, 30 people have OA, for example, or out of the positive tests, half of them were, were truly positive. And you've gotta do a little bit of working out to figure out what numbers go in each box. But say, for example, you get something like this. So 15, 10, five, and 20. So the first thing to double check is that the numbers all add up. So once you put four numbers in these boxes, they should add up to the total number of people that you're being taught to look at. So 50 people with OA or not with OA, you need to make sure there's 50 people represented in this table. And there's another quick check, say for example, you've been told that 30 people don't have OA and 20 people do. Again, you can add things up. So of those who don't have OA, that's 30. Of those who do have OA, that's 20. And it works the other way around as well. If you've been told, for example, that of all the tests, 25 were positive, then you just got to check that of all the positive tests, 15 plus 10 is 25. So do a few quick checks just to make sure the numbers add up before you start using this table to work out your calculations. So if you're looking at sensitivity, that's going to be the proportion of people with the disease that the test picks up. Now the way I used to remember doing this is looking at my table and learning the pattern. So I used to always remember that sensitivity was in the left column and it went downwards. So it was A over A plus C and that happens every time. So sensitivity equals A over A plus C. So I always used to remember it in a downward arrow. The sensitivity. Specificity was almost the opposite. So specificity starts here, so it would upwards on the right side. So it used to be D over D plus B. So specificity equals D over D plus B. And remember, specificity is looking at the proportion of those who don't have the disease that come up with a negative result. So you can then use this to work out your positive predictive value and your negative predictive value. Now your positive predictive value is the proportion of positive results that are correct and your negative predictive value is the proportion of negative results that are correct. And I always remember these going horizontally. So your specificity and sensitivity go um, vertically, whereas your predictive values go horizontally. So if it's your positive predictive value, you're looking at your positive tests, and I used to remember the arrow went this way. So it's A over A plus B, Positive prediction value equals a over, oops, sorry, a over a plus b. And your negative predictive value was the opposite. So you're looking at the negative results and it used to get this way around. So your negative predictive value is d over c plus d. Equals d over c plus d. Now there are obviously other ways of working out sensitivity and specificity and there are different ways of remembering in your mind as well. But if you're someone that finds this difficult or someone that finds it confusing, especially when you're a time pressurized environment like the exam, then having a little protocol where you have your letters in place, where you put your numbers in, and then you can remember which way the particular calculations go, it can make it that little bit easier. And also understanding what sensitivity, specificity, PPV and NPV actually mean and represent can also help you in working out which way the arrows go, particularly when you get a little bit stressed or confused in the middle of the big day. So I hope you guys have spent some value to you. I hope you feel a little bit more confident about those particular areas of statistics. Now, obviously, that's not the whole of statistics. We've not been able to cover everything. There's quite a bit more that you need to do a little bit of background reading and learning on, but this is just the basics to get started. And remember those key three things. Don't fear stats, yeah? It's something that you need to work on sometimes to understand, but you shouldn't be frightened of it. Don't ignore stats. Don't just think, I'll leave it, I'll do everything else, and hope I'll make my marks up. And don't cram stats, don't leave it right to the last minute, hoping that I'll just learn those equations a day or two days before my exam. There's lots of other videos about the AKT and the CSA and other aspects of GP training on our channel, so I encourage you to have a quick look and subscribe if you find it useful. We try and get videos out every month or every two, two a month on, on average. If there's any suggestions that you have about videos that you want making, AKT related, CSA related, or, or GP training in general, just drop me a line or get in contact. My, my details should be down below. If you've got the AKT coming up in the near future, I'm sure it'll be great. We do cover a lot of these things on our AKT courses if anyone's interested. 
But hopefully I'll see some of you guys soon. Take care.